What's up, everybody? This is Alex Christopher with The Durad, and I'm here with Alexander Mercurius, Editor-in-Chief of The Durad. And today we're going to be taking a look at the Munich Security Conference and the ties between Germany and the United States. Alexander, we had the Munich Security Conference, didn't get a lot of media attention. Uh, Probably rightly so for, for the U.S. media because things didn't turn out so well for Mike Pence and the United States as they attended the security conference. But we are seeing a, a definite shift in Germany's attitude towards their, their strongest and, and most trusted ally, I would say, which is the United States. But things are changing and, the, and Germany seems to be drifting away from the U.S.'s orbit. Can you explain what happened at the security conference and what is causing Germany to actually start to rebel against the United States? Yes, I mean, it's important, first of all, we don't overstate the significance of what happened at the Munich Security Conference. I mean, Germany isn't leaving, leaving NATO anytime soon or anything like that. But what we are starting to see is, I think, a sea change in German attitudes because what happened was that uh, Pence, Pompeo, and I think Bolton is always lurking somewhere in the background, even if he wasn't <laughs> physically there. Um, firstly, they attended this conference in Warsaw, which is supposed to be about Middle East peace, but which was, in fact, all about um, um, a ramping up the pressure on Iran. Um, uh, Pence made some incredibly critical comments about uh, the U.S.'s European allies, who want to maintain some kind of relationship with Iran. And then, of course, the Munich Security Conference followed. Now, this is the big gathering together of the NATO leaders. It happens every year, um, but the NATO leaders are there. Sometimes the Russians are also there. Um, they weren't uh, very visible, but uh, Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, was there. And anyway, they were all there. And um, what happened was that Pence, having made all those extremely anti-European comments um, in Warsaw, then ramped them up even further in Munich. And he said to the Europeans, but first and foremost to the Germans, um, you've got to support the United States in everything the United States basically does. You've got to crack down on Iran. You've got to crack down even more on the Russians, ramp up sanctions on the Russians even further. You've got to start, uh, you've got to give up on Nord Stream 2, and you've got to sever all your economic links with Russia. And Merkel, who represents Germany and is the German Chancellor, who has been, let's just be very clear about this, up to now, a rigid Atlanticist. I mean, she has been the most pro-American chancellor Germany has had since the 1960s. Anyway, she stood up and she said very clearly to Pence and to the uh, to everybody there, Germany is not going to follow these uh, these orders. We're going to maintain our economic links with Russia. In fact, we're going to even improve on them. We're going to press ahead with Nord Stream 2, and sanctions are, are, are basically have reached their limit. So what it seems is happening is that all this pressure from the U.S. to get Germany to change its position and to take a harder line against Russia is having the opposite effect. It is making the, the Germans increasingly exasperated as they start to see that U.S. Uh, uh, policy is cutting across German national interests and the Germans very tentatively but uh, increasingly openly are now standing up to the U.S. And for the first time in many years, they're beginning to say no. Now, as I said, when this comes from someone like Merkel, I think that's very important. And one has to wonder when Merkel is gone and Germany has a, a new chancellor with perhaps less neoliberal and Atlanticist baggage than Merkel has, whether this drift uh, away from, the, from this close alignment with the U.S. is going to accelerate. 
Yeah, like a like a Schroeder type who had an excellent relationship with uh, with Putin in Russia. A very very close relationship, and of course he personally still does. But the point to make yeah. about Schroeder is, of course, that his ideas of pursuing an Ostpolitik with Russia were popular in Germany, and they still are. Uh, um, uh, uh, public opinion in Germany. Uh, uh, public opinion polls show that uh, uh, German opinion, public opinion, is hardening against the U.S. and is becoming more sympathetic to closer relations with Russia and China. It turns out that most Germans now distrust the U.S. more than they distrust the Chinese and the Russians, which is a pretty remarkable thing. Yeah, it's a re remarkable thing. And I want you to comment a little bit on Merkel because I've, I've read many stories about Merkel and the way she governs. And I've read that she is governed and has traditionally governed and continues to govern via opinion polls. Yeah. She takes the polls very seriously yeah. and she moves according to the ways she feels the opinion polls are moving. And so if the opinion polls are moving towards a hardening stance against the U.S. and more towards Eurasia and Asia in general, then it makes sense that Merkel, she's not doing, she's not, she's not lashing out at Pence because that's the way she personally feels, but she's just following the opinion polls. Would that be a correct uh, way to look at this? That is exactly right. And of course, there are opinion polls and then there are other opinion polls. There's the ordinary opinion polls, which are the ones we have in which, you know, people are asked in Germany what they think and they report to pollsters and they're published. But of course, there is the other opinion poll, which is in some ways more influential, which is what the German business communities and industrial groups are thinking. And, um, you know, I, I have quite a few contacts with Germany. And I recently read an article by the US economist Michael Hudson, who has also recently traveled to Germany, and he said that um, he found that um, um, opinion amongst German industry, in, within Germany, across German industry, is becoming increasingly exasperated with uh, uh, the direction of the flow of policy from the US, and is now increasingly pushing for a rapprochement with Russia. I have to say, that is exactly my own experience. So, um, um, in Germany, the German business community has a great deal of influence, especially on the CDU, which is the party that Merkel leads, which has traditionally been the party of German business. OK, Alexander, I'm going to read you an article from Tan Lungo. And uh, the article is, t is entitled Merkel Draws the Line Against Trump. And in that article, uh, Tom makes four points as to why he sees Germany carving out its own independent path for the first time outside of the U.S. orbit. I'm going to read you those four points and I want you to comment on them. It's clear that Merkel's priorities for what is left of her term in office are as follows. Number one, carve out an independent path of EU foreign policy from the U.S. through the creation of an EU army, obviating the need for NATO. And number two, end U.S. occupation of Germany. Number three, secure Germany's energy future, which also secures its political future as the leader of the European Union by stitching together the continent with Russian energy arteries, Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream. And finally, number four, manage the shift away from NATO as a controlling force in Europe's relationship with Russia, which doesn't serve Europe's long term purposes. Alexander, what do you make of Tom's uh, four points for Germany's uh, drifting away from the U.S.'s orbit? Right. I think I think Tom is one of the most insightful commentators I know. But I think on this one, he's running a little bit ahead of the curve. I, I don't think Merkel is really uh, preparing to distance Germany from the U.S. I do, and certainly not in the uh, relatively short period that I expect her to remain German Chancellor. But... Having said that, I think I think Tom Luongo has got a lot of very good points there. If you look at Germany's geography, um, you can argue, and I think it's a compelling point, that Germany's natural partners 
looking forward as the 21st century progresses are the rising Eurasian powers of China and Russia. China is very rapidly evolving into Germany's major industrial partner. China increasingly buys very large quantities of German industrial goods. And of course, Russia is Germany's biggest uh, energy supplier. So it is completely logical that Germany, which it is clear from opinion polls, does not feel any sort of threat from Russia or, of course, from China, would want to start shifting increasingly towards a closer relationship with the Eurasian powers, with Russia and China. And I think that is what is going to happen. I don't think Merkel herself is going to sit down and uh, uh, try and reorient Germany in that direction. But I don't think she has to, because I think German industry, German business, and an awful lot of people in Germany are already moving there. So, um, what you said earlier about Ger uh, Merkel being very attuned to German opinion and listening very carefully to what opinion polls say will in itself lead her increasingly in that direction. So I, I predict that you know, a couple of years down the line, especially um, as the EU project begins to unravel, which I predict it will, um, and Germany becomes less anchored within the Atlanticist system, the drift towards uh, Russia and China will accelerate. And I think that these um, clashes that we saw at the Munich Security Conference with Merkel uh, for once standing up for German interests in the face of extreme pressure from the Americans and from Pence, um, I think that is a, a straw in the wind and a sign of what is to come. What do you make of, uh, uh, before we get into, I want to delve in a little bit deeper into the, the energy and the economic yeah. side of things, because I think that's going to be the first domino to fall. Yeah. If I, I believe it actually is falling as we speak yes. with Nord Stream 2. But before we get to that, what do you make of German, Germany's possibility to, number one, spearhead an EU army, and number two, start moving itself and other EU countries away from NATO. Is that a possibility in the short term, medium term, long term or not? Right. Long? I mean, let's first of all talk about the EU army, because I've been quite straightforward about this. We've discussed this before. I don't think this EU army amounts to anything. Germany today is not a major military power. France is to some extent, but Germany is not. I think this EU army is Emmanuel Macron's uh, uh, stupid idea frankly, to try to tie Germany more deeply into France, which at this moment in time is very Atlanticist and very aligned with the US. So I, I don't think we should really pin any hopes on this EU army, which I don't think is going to happen in, 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 any, in any very true sense. But if you're looking at the economics, and it is in the economics that Germany really uh, uh, matters, if Germany recalibr recalibrates towards the Eurasian powers, towards Russia and China, um, then NATO and the EU will very rapidly unravel because Germany is the powerhouse. It's the economic powerhouse of the EU. The other EU states, uh, especially those in Central and Eastern Europe, will have to follow and without the EU and without Germany playing that role of holding the EU together in an Atlanticist uh, 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 coalition, NATO itself becomes unsustainable. So Germany is the pivotal power. It always has been. It has been right since the start of the Cold War, when the whole point of the Cold War was to anchor Germany in the West and to keep it um, at odds with Russia. All right, and let's get back to the energy and the economic side of things, because that's playing out right now as we speak, specifically with Nord Stream 2. And I'm going to read you another excerpt from Tom's excellent article, and you can comment on that. 
Merkel will play both sides of the game for as long as she can, but Trump and his merry band of neocon psychotics are determined to stop Nord Stream 2. They realize pipelines like these represent near permanent connections between Europe and Russia, which the deadens, which then deadens Trump's desire to maintain the empire through controlling the flow and price of energy. Right. Well, Alexander, what do you make of, of right, that statement? I mean, the, the, one, the one point of difference that I have with it is that I, I would take Trump out of the picture, actually. I mean, Donald Trump doesn't like Angela Merkel, as we know. He doesn't like the EU, as we also know. He doesn't think very much of NATO, as we also know. He's talked about these things many times. That is not his agenda. It is the agenda uh, uh, of, of Bolton, Pompeo and Pence. And... Um, Tom Luongo has got that absolutely right. And again, I don't think that Angela Merkel particularly wants to play the kind of game that Tom Luongo uh, um, is outlined for her, you know, playing both sides against each other whilst quietly realigning Germany with the Eurasian powers. I don't think that's what she's thinking, but I think he is right and that is what we are increasingly going to see happening. We're going to have constant protestations of loyalty from the Germans as they continue to forge their economic links with the Eurasian powers, which, to be very clear, will eventually evolve into political links also. And um, Tom Longo is absolutely right. When you start building pipelines like Nord Stream 2, mm, they become right. permanent facts. Um, once uh, Nord Stream 2 is there and the gas is moving down it, it is not going to be turned off. That is where the gas for Germany is going to come. That's going to link Germany more closely into, into the Russian uh, um, oil and gas system. Merkel already visits uh, uh, and meets with Putin on a very regular basis. Merkel already travels to China on a very regular basis. Whichever chancellor succeeds her will start to do that even more. Yeah, it really is a strong bond that, that the gas pipeline will create, a very unbreakable type of bond. Absolutely, and it's a natural one, as we said many times. I mean, it's, it's the logical one. One only has to look at the map to see where the obvious place for Germany to get its to get his gas is, and it's Russia. And as I said, once the uh, uh, Chinese have completed with the Russians all, all these uh, uh, all these roads and railways that the Chinese are building across Russia, which will link China ultimately to Central Europe, including of course Germany. Once those links are built. Um, we're going to have, in, a, in effect, a single economic system separate from that of the U.S. And where economics uh, start, politics follow. Was it not Brzezinski who said that he who controls Eurasia controls the world? Well, I think. Well, it wasn't. I think it was Brzezinski actually. But he, On the grand chess, but I think it was. I think it was. I don't know if I don't know if it was controls the world, but I think he. He placed a very big emphasis um, on whoever can control Eurasia is pretty much running a lot of the yes, show. He, he did say that. And of course, I mean, that was one of the reasons why he wanted to break Russia up, basically. And that was his plan, because right. he felt that if uh, Russia held together, um, it would become the integrative state that would bring Eurasia together. It's a view, by the way, that goes back very far to a British geopolitician called Mackinder, who said that uh, um, he who controls uh, uh, Eurasia controls the world island, the world island being, you know, this vast block of, of powers at the center, and he who controls the world island controls the world. Um, it, it, the idea being that it would push the United States and other powers to the periphery with Eurasia, Germany, China and Russia being at the center. Personally, I don't go that far. I think that world trade systems today are more complicated and that the United States will remain a very powerful country uh, uh, with huge resources uh, um, and great technological and industrial uh, uh, resources that it can continue to draw upon. But certainly 
if Germany, China and Russia um, were to uh, 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 develop into some kind of combination, that would be a very powerful bloc and arguably the world's preeminent one. All right, Alexander Bercuris, editor-in-chief of The Duran. Thank you very much. Guys, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below and click on the notifications bell to get notifications every time we push out a new video. And remember to go to The Duran Shop, pick up a t-shirt to help support The Duran. And in the description box down below, you will find links to our PayPal and Patreon pages. Please donate to us. That helps us out a lot. And you can get a copy of this video in audio format. Follow us on iTunes and SoundCloud. Go to thedurand.com and see all the articles that Alexander is linking up to every day. Alexander Bercuris, Editor-in-Chief of The Durand. Thank you once again. Until next time, everybody, take care.